And now, it is my very great pleasure to introduce someone who really embraces the power of proximity and who understands at a profound level just how much isolation depletes closeness. An extraordinary lawyer, an extraordinary activist, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, and most recently, and I think spectacularly, the founder of the Legacy Museum, from enslavement to mass incarceration. Brian Stevenson. Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what a thrill to be back here at Skoll. It's wonderful uh, to be with you this afternoon, and I'm delighted that the organizers have asked us to talk about the power of proximity, because I am persuaded that at this time in our world where there's so much conflict and division, where there's so much suffering and inequality, it is critical that we begin thinking about what it will take for us to create more justice, to change the world. I come from a country that now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We have 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's incarcerated. We're putting women and children and people in jails and prisons indiscriminately. Uh, today in the United States, one in three uh, black male babies born is expected to go to jail or prison. There is despair. In the communities where I work, I go into communities where I talk to 13-year-old children who tell me they don't believe they're going to be free by the time they're 21. And, and that despair and these problems are, are everywhere in the world. And I don't want to talk about the problems, I want to talk about the solutions. And I am persuaded that the first thing we have to do if we're going to create a more just society is we've got to understand the need to get proximate. It is in proximity to the poor, the excluded, the neglected, that we understand things that we cannot understand from a distance. Many of us have been taught that if there's a bad part of town, you need to stay away from the bad part of the town. Many of us have been taught if there are parts of the globe where there's conflict and suffering, you should stay far away. Today, I'm going to argue that all of us need to find ways to get closer to the marginalized, the disabled, the disfavored, the excluded, the incarcerated, because in proximity, there is this power that we begin to understand. Our politicians fail us too often because they're so distant from the problems. They don't hear the things you hear when you're close to suffering. They don't see the things you see when you're close to inequality. There is power in proximity. I learned about proximity from my grandmother. I grew up in a family where my grandmother was the classic African-American matriarch. She was tough. She was strong. She was also loving and kind. My grandmother was the end of every argument in our family. Uh, she was also the start of a lot of arguments in our family. And when I was a little boy, my grandmother would always have these tactics. And when she would see me as a child, she'd come up to me and she'd give me these hugs. And she'd squeeze me so tightly, I thought she was trying to hurt me. And I'd see my grandmother an hour later. My grandmother would look at me and she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And if I said no, she would jump on me again. And by the time I was 10, my grandmother had taught me every time I would see her, the first thing I would say is, Mama, I always feel you hugging me. And she'd smile the smile, and I didn't appreciate what she was teaching me until I was much older. She lived into her 90s. She worked as a domestic her whole life. And she developed a, a cancer, and she broke her hip, and she was dying. And I went to see her on her deathbed, and I was pouring my heart out because she meant the world to me. And I was just saying everything, holding her hand. Her eyes were closed. I didn't think she could hear me, and it was time for me to leave. And when I left, I stood up, and when I was about to walk away, my grandmother squeezed my hand, and she opened her eyes, and the last thing she said to me, she said, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And then she said, I'm always going to be hugging you. And I can't tell you how powerful that is. There have been times in my life when I felt pushed and overwhelmed and struck, but I feel this presence, and all of us have the capacity to get close to people who are suffering, close to people who have fallen down, and if we can't do anything else, we can wrap our arms around them, but we can't do it if we're not proximate. There is power in proximity. We'll learn things, we'll see things that we have to understand if we want to change the world. I'm the product of someone's choice to get proximate. I grew up in a community where black children couldn't go to the public schools. Started my education in a colored school. And then lawyers came into our community and they made them open up the public schools. And because they got proximate to poor black kids like me, I'm standing here talking to you today.
I got to go to high school. I got to go to college. I was a philosophy major in college. Nobody in my family had gone to college. I was trying to figure out how to stay in school, and I started looking into graduate programs. And I didn't know that in the United States, at least, if you want to do graduate work in history or English or political science to get admitted to graduate school, you have to know something about history, English, or political science. <laughs> I was very intimidated by that, so I kept looking. And to be honest, that's how I found law school. Uh, it was very clear to me, you don't need to know anything to go to law school. But when I got to law school, I was disillusioned until I went to death row and I found condemned people literally dying for legal assistance. And it was in proximity to the condemned that I began to understand the importance of witness and suffering and struggling. But more than that, I began to understand the importance of justice, of equality, of the rule of law. I invite you all to get proximate to the poor, the excluded. There is something waiting for you there. And you will learn more. You will get more than you give. There is power in proximity. But we won't change the world just by getting proximate. The second thing I'm persuaded we have to do is that we have to change the narratives underneath the policy issues, the problems that we constantly talk about. Underneath the policy debate, there's a narrative. You, in the United States, we have mass incarceration because we declared this misguided war on drugs. And the reason why we declare this misguided war on drugs has to do with a narrative. It's what I call the politics of fear and anger. We had politicians that were preaching fear and anger. They wanted us afraid and angry. And when we allow ourselves to be governed by fear and anger, we tolerate things that we shouldn't tolerate. We accept things we shouldn't accept. And all over the planet, you can see how oppression thrives. And if you ask the oppressor why they do what they do, they'll give you a narrative of fear and anger. And so we have to change that narrative of fear and anger. We have to resist those narratives that push us away from one another, that don't allow us to recognize the humanity of one another. Those narratives are the threat. Changing the narrative is key. I've learned this from working with clients. I've spent time representing people wrongly convicted, Anthony Ray Hinton spent 30 years on death row, and when we began to work with one another, we realized they just didn't value his humanity. That narrative had to change. We're trying to do something about race and racial bias in our country. In the United States, we're not free. We're burdened by a history of racial inequality. I don't think we're a free society. I think we have a history of racial inequality that's created a kind of smog in the air. We are a post-genocide society that hasn't recognized that identity. We did terrible things to native people when Europeans came to the continent. And instead of acknowledging that violence, we said, no, those native people are different. They're savages. We created this narrative of racial difference. And then we got into the era of slavery. And I don't think the great evil of American slavery was uh, involuntary servitude or forced labor. I think the true evil of American slavery was this narrative of racial difference, this ideology of white supremacy that we created to justify enslavement. We said black people are different than white people. They can't do this, they can't do that. They're not fully human. And that narrative of racial difference, that was the true evil. In our country, we uh, passed the 13th Amendment to end slavery, and it talks about ending involuntary servitude and forced labor, but it doesn't talk about ending this narrative of racial difference, and because of that, I don't think slavery ended in America in 1865. I think it just evolved. It turned into decades of terrorism and violence. We pulled black people out of their homes. We murdered them. We lynched them. We maimed them. There is this legacy of racial terror. And when you talk to African Americans today, they tell you that they get angry when they hear somebody talking about how we're dealing with domestic terrorism for the first time in our nation's history after 9-11. The demographic geography of our nation was shaped by this terror. And then we had this effort to overcome segregation. And even there, the narrative didn't change the way it needs to. And today, we still live in a country where black and brown people are presumed dangerous and guilty, and that burden weighs on us, and the narrative has to change. That's why we're building this museum. That's why we're building a monument, a memorial, to help us reflect on this history. I believe that narratives change when we commit ourselves to truth and reconciliation, and we haven't told the truth about what we've done to some of the societies around the world, the ways in which we've exploited people, taken advantage of systems, the structural poverty, the systems that create inequality and injustice, we've got to tell the truth, and that will allow us to change the narrative. But even changing the narrative won't be enough. The third thing I'm persuaded we have to do, we have to stay hopeful. These are times when it's easy to become hopeless about what's possible, and you have to fight against hopelessness, I believe, that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Injustice prevails where hopelessness persists. 
And I believe this community and communities across the world that want more justice have to commit themselves to believing things we haven't seen. Hopefulness is believing something you haven't seen. Hope is what will get you to stand up when other people say sit down. Hope is what will get you to speak when other people say be quiet. Your hope is your superpower. And if we protect our hope, we protect our capacity to be a witness against these things that are coming at us, then we understand what it means to truly change the world. We've got to get proximate. We've got to change narratives. We've got to stay hopeful. But the fourth and final thing we're going to have to do, if we really want to create more justice, we're going to have to be willing to do uncomfortable things. I hate talking about this one, but it's necessary. We cannot change the world. We cannot make a difference simply by being proximate, simply by changing narratives, simply by staying hopeful. The fourth and final thing we've got to be willing to do, we've got to be willing to do inconvenient and uncomfortable things. The world changes, justice rises when good people are willing to do the inconvenient and uncomfortable. And it's hard. It's very hard. It's hard because we're human, and as humans, we're biologically and psychologically programmed to do what's comfortable. We like comfort. And I've tried to research this one. I have. I've looked for some examples where justice prevailed, where equality triumphed, where oppression was ended, and nobody had to do anything inconvenient and uncomfortable. <laughs> I can't find any examples of that. No, it only happens when good people are willing to do uncomfortable things. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against comfort. That's not what I'm saying. I gave a talk in Mississippi. The people met me at the airport. They said, oh, Mr. Stevenson, we know all about you. We know what kind of work you do. We know what kind of lawyer you are. And then they said, Mr. Stevenson, we're having our conference at the luxurious Doubletree Hotel. They said, we decided that you would not want to stay at the luxurious Doubletree Hotel. They said, we've asked one of the farmers to put you up at the barn. I said, what is wrong with you? I said, of course I want to stay at the luxurious Double Tree Hotel. I like those chocolate chip cookies just like everybody else. That's not... No, what I'm talking about is that sometimes you have to position yourself to be a witness. I represent condemned people. I represent people on death row, and I've had the privilege of winning a lot of cases, but I've also been in that painful place where we could not succeed. A few years ago, I represented a man who was facing execution in 30 days. He was intellectually disabled. I got involved in this case very late. And I went to the trial court and I said, you can't execute this man. He suffers from intellectual disability. And the courts have banned the execution of people with intellectual disability, but this court said, no, it's too late. I said, no, it's not too late. I went to the state court. They said, too late. The appeals court said, too late. The federal court said, too late. Every court I went to said, too late. And in too many places in the world, we seem more committed to finality than fairness. And on the day of the execution, I was waiting for a ruling from the United States Supreme Court. I was pacing in my office and finally the phone rang. And it was the clerk of court at the United States Supreme Court. The court told me, the clerk told me that their, my motion for a stay had been considered and reviewed, but the judgment of the court was that our motion was due to be denied too late. I then had to get on the phone and do the hardest thing I do in my work. I got this man on this phone, and I said to him, I said, I'm so sorry, but I can't stop this execution. And then the man did the thing that I dread the most in my work. He started to cry. And through his tears, he just began to sob. And the next thing I knew, the man was on the other end of the phone, just sobbing. He said to me, he said, Mr. Stevenson, please don't hang up. There's something important I want to say to you. I said, of course. And then this man tried to say something to me, but in addition to being intellectually disabled, he had another challenge. When he got nervous, when he got anxious, when he got overwhelmed, he had a speech impediment. And he would begin to stutter, and all of a sudden, this man couldn't get out a single word. And he kept trying to say something. He kept trying to talk, but he couldn't get out a single word. And he kept trying, and he kept trying. And the more he tried and failed, the more he was ripping my heart apart. And before I knew it, I was standing there holding the phone, and tears were running down my face. And the man kept trying, and the man kept trying. And it was so overwhelming, so uncomfortable, that my mind wandered. I remembered... When I was about nine or ten going to church one Sunday, my mom had taken me to church. I was there with my friends. We were talking. And I remembered on the night of this scheduled execution meeting this little boy. And he was standing there at the church, and he wasn't saying anything. And I asked him, what's your name? Where are you from? And I remembered that night how that little boy tried to answer my question. But he also had a very severe speech impediment, and he began to stutter. And then I remembered that I did something really ignorant when that little boy tried to tell, answer my question in church all those years ago, I remembered that I laughed at that little boy. My mom came over and she gave me this look I'd never seen before and she pulled me aside. She said, Brian, don't you ever laugh at somebody because they can't get their words out right. I tried to apologize. My mom wasn't having it. She said, now you go over there and you tell that little boy you're sorry. 
I said, okay, mom. And I took a step to go see this little boy. My mom grabbed me by the arm. She said, wait, after you tell that little boy you're sorry, I want you to hug that little boy. I rolled my eyes a little bit, and I said, okay, mom. And then my mom grabbed me by the arm again. She said, wait, after you hug that little boy, I want you to tell that little boy you love him. I said, mom, I can't go over there and tell that little boy I love him. And she gave me that look again, so I did. I went over to this little boy. I said, look, man, I'm really sorry. And then I lunged at this child and gave him a, a little boy man hug. And then I tried to say to this little boy as insincerely as I possibly could, I said, look, man, you know, well, I don't know. Well, you know, I don't know. Well, um, I love you. And what I'd forgotten until the night of this execution is how that little boy hugged me back. And then I remembered how he whispered flawlessly in my ear. He said, I love you too. And I was thinking about that while this client tried to get his words out. And finally, my client got his words out. He said, Mr. Stevenson, I want to thank you for representing me. He said, I want to thank you for fighting for me. And the last thing that man said to me, he said, Mr. Stevenson, I love you for trying to save my life. They pulled him away, they strapped him to a gurney, and they executed him. I hung up the phone, I said, I can't do this anymore. I've gotten too close, it's too much, it's too uncomfortable. I kept thinking about how broken he was. The question in my mind was, why do we want to kill all the broken people on this planet? What is it about us that when we see brokenness, we get angry, we want to hurt it, we want to crush it? And then I realized that all of my clients are broken people. I represent the broken I work in a system that is broken by fear and anger. And that night I said, I can't do this anymore. It's just too much. And I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I sat down and I began reflecting on whether I'd gotten too proximate. And it was in that moment of reflection that I realized something I'd never realized before. That was the night I realized why I do what I do. And it shocked me. And what I realized is that I don't do what I do because I've been trained as a lawyer. I don't do what I do because somebody has to do it. I don't do what I do because it's about human rights. I don't do what I do because if I don't do it, no one will. What I realized that night that I'd never realized before is that I do what I do because I'm broken too. And I tell you that because when you get proximate, you see suffering. There will be times when you cry, when you feel overwhelmed. There will be nicks, there will be cuts, there will be scars. But I'm here to tell you as a survivor of brokenness that it's in brokenness that we begin to understand the way justice is supposed to work. It's the broken among us that can teach us the way compassion can heal. It's the broken that appreciate the power of mercy. It is the broken places in the world where justice can grow and redemption can be seen and we can see real change on our planet. And I'm not afraid of being broken. It's in brokenness that we understand the power of humanity, that we respect one another's rights, that we get closer. So in brokenness, I want to tell you that we should not fear getting proximate. We should not fear changing narratives. We should not fear doing the hopeful things that are necessary. And as we do them, we'll learn things. I've learned that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. I believe that for every human being. I think if someone tells a lie, they're not just a liar. I think if someone takes something that doesn't belong to them, they're not just a thief. I think even if you kill someone, you're not just a killer. And justice requires that we know the other things you are. In proximity, we see these things that we can't see from a distance. What I've seen is that the opposite of poverty isn't wealth. I don't believe that. We talk too much about money sometimes. I believe that the opposite of poverty is justice. And when we do justice, we deconstruct the conditions that give rise to structural poverty. And finally, what I've come to believe is that our character, our commitment to justice has to be reflected not in how we treat the powerful and the rich and the privileged. It's going to be reflected in how we treat the poor, the excluded, the incarcerated. I'll end with this. I was giving a talk in a church and an old man came into the church. He was sitting in a wheelchair. And he was staring at me the whole time I was talking with this stern, angry look on his face. I couldn't figure out why is he looking at me so sternly. And when I finished my talk, people came up. They were very nice and appropriate. But that older black man in the wheelchair was just sitting there. And then he wheeled himself to the front. And when he got in front of me, he put his hand up. He said, do you know what you're doing? And I just stood there. And then he asked me again. He said, do you know what you're doing? And I stepped back and I mumbled something. And then he asked me one last time. He said, do you know what you're doing? And then this older black man looked at me. He said, I'm going to tell you what you're doing. He said, you're beating the drum for justice. You keep beating the drum for justice. And I was so moved. I was also really relieved because I just didn't know what was about. <laughs> and then this man grabbed me by my jacket and he pulled me into his wheelchair. He said, come here, come here, come here. I'm going to show you something. And this older man turned his head. He said, you see the scar I have behind my right ear? He said, I got that scar in Greene County, Alabama, 1963, trying to register people to vote. 
He turned his head and he said, you see this cut I have down here at the bottom of my neck? I got that cut in Mississippi trying to register people to vote. He turned his head and he said, you see this bruise? That's my dark spot. I got it in Birmingham, Alabama in 1965 trying to register people to vote. Then he looked at me and he said, I'm going to tell you something, young man. He said, people look at me, they think I'm some old man sitting in a wheelchair covered with cuts and bruises and scars. He said, but I'm, I'm going to tell you something. He said, these are not my cuts. He said, they're not my bruises. He said, these are not my scars. He said, these are my medals of honor. I believe we honor what it means to do human rights work, what it means to be a member of this community, what it means to stand up for justice when we allow ourselves to get close enough, even though we may get cut in nicks, when we stay hopeful, when we change narratives, and when we do uncomfortable things to create a more just world. I'm excited that we would take time from our lives to come to a place like this to talk about it, to focus on it, to think about it. But more than that, I'm excited that when we leave, we can find new ways to understand the power of proximity and change the world. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.